I'd like to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, therapeutic plasma exchange. This is a, a relatively new, newly uh, recognized uh, extracorporeal therapy for veterinary medicine uh, that many of us are starting to, uh, to uh, find applications for and uh, many of the platforms that you'll be using um, uh, for hemodialysis will also permit uh, the use of uh, the, the ability to do um, uh, plasma exchange treatments as well. And so I ask the question, when we talk about extracorporeal therapies, the question is, how pure is your blood? You know, how many of you are really true blue bloods? Dr. Polson, of course. But uh, the, the, the real question is, how pure is your blood? And, and the reality is our blood is often very contaminated. It's contaminated with endogenous toxins. That's why we do dialysis. Uh, it could be contaminated with exogenous toxins. That's why we do dialysis for, for these poisons. Uh, there are many times these animals get uh, uh, inappropriate drug administration that, uh, that extracorporeal therapies are very, very useful for um, uh, management. But also viruses and bacteria can be removed by certain time, kinds of extracorporeal strategies. And what we'll focus on uh, for, uh, extra, uh, for uh, therapeutic uh, plasma exchange, or your, body, your blood can be contaminated with inappropriate antibodies or inappropriate proteins that actually are pathologic, and we need to alter those contaminants in the blood. We can also have abnormal cells like neoplastic cells uh, that uh, we'll consider a blood contaminant. And one that all of you should really, really start to appreciate is that yes, water, excessive water is a contaminant of your blood and oftentimes is a, is a uh, contaminant that we have to remove. And so the, the role of extracorporeal therapy then, uh, like a great big net, is to scoop the blood and take out all of those contaminants that are inappropriate and then will alter the pathogenesis of the disease state that is a uh, resultant of those contaminants. And the major extracorporeal therapies that we use for blood purification would be hemodialysis that we've all been talking about most of the week, hemoperfusion, another strategy for purifying the blood that we haven't talked about to any great extent, and then finally therapeutic apheresis, which will be the, the subject of what I want to speak about now. All of these therapies share the same basic process that we take blood out of the animal, usually pump it out of the animal. It goes through some kind of a gizmo or device or apparatus <laughs> that grabs the contaminants and then returns back to the patient a purified blood that hopefully then alters or corrects the, uh, the pathologic state that, that is there. And uh, apheresis is, a, is a, an extracorporeal blood purification process. And what apheresis means, it comes from the Greek word meaning to take away. Uh, and so what we're doing then is we're taking away something out of the blood. And there are, several, there are two major types of apheresis therapy. There's therapeutic plasma exchange and we're, we're taking away specific properties of plasma that may be pathologic. And it's used for immune-mediated diseases, it's used for gamma optins where you have abnormal gamma globulins, it's used to remove large toxic molecules, particularly if those molecules are bound to, to plasma proteins that can't be then uh, effectively dialyzed across our membranes and for various kinds of dyslipidemias in human patients uh, that, again, are not really amenable to uh, dilated therapy. It's also used in a variety of, uh, of uh, uh, blood disorders like plasmapheresis to, uh, to harvest plasma, leukophoresis, the harvesting of white cells, and particularly if those white cells are neoplastic cells and you want to get rid of them for patients that have leukemias. Um, uh, monos uh, mononuclear cell uh, collection, and uh, this is a source that you can uh, use to derive uh, hematogenous uh, stem cells, and for red blood cell exchange. And for here, it, it gets most of its application 
for diseases like sickle cell anemia where you've got abnormal red cells that are going to cause problems. You need to get rid of those abnormal cells and replace them with, with other cells. So for therapeutic plasma exchange, again, the same sort of uh, circuitry, pull blood out of the patient, but in this case, instead of a, a dialyzer, uh, uh, the, the, the device that we use, or the gizmo that we use to grab these, uh, these abnormal contaminants is actually a centrifuge. So we centrifuge the blood uh, into its various components, and then we pick out and remove and we, or replace the component that we want to exchange and then the purified blood goes back to the patient. Uh, and, and in our apparatus, then we've got a machine that's got a bunch of pumps on it. We have one pump that pumps the blood out of the patient's body. And in this case, then it pumps it down into the centrifuge. Uh, from the centrifuge, we pull off plasma up into a waste container that has all the, the nasty ingredients in it. And then we replace the amount of plasma that we uh, the abnormal with the dirty plasma, to use uh, Dr. Foster's terminology, um, uh, with a, a replacement fluid that uh, is, uh, is purified. Uh, and so mostly what I'll be talking to you about is centrifugal apheresis, and in this case then the blood is delivered to, uh, to a, a belt or a, a, ch a channel uh, that sits at the periphery of a centrifuge, the centrifuge spins the plasma and actually it, it accumulates it in a little cartridge that sits here right at the edge or the periphery of the, uh, of, on the outside rim of the centrifuge. The various layers of the blood are going are gonna to settle out in this, in this device. Probably you can see it a little bit better on this next one. So that chamber is here. Uh, we're looking at it kind of uh, looking straight down, but the edge of the centrifuge is going to be out here, so the forces are going to be a force in this direction. Mm -hmm. The most dense components of the blood are going to settle out on the outside. These will be the red blood cells. Then we'll have the, an, another layer of less dense material. This is usually the platelets and the, mono and the, and the leukocytes that, that settle on top of the, the red cells, just like in the tube. And then the least dense material is the plasma. And then we can selectively, once we've separated the blood into all these various components, we can selectively take off the piece that we want, the piece that's abnormal, and then exchange that for a component that is, uh, that is not uh, abnormal. And this is called centrifugal agents. Uh, the the whole the centrifuge sits in this this chamber down here. It's a little window, and the question that we always ask: What's in the hole, Shrek? And this, and this is Sean, and we do think that he looks a lot like Shrek. <laughs> <laughs> and so here's here's our real life chamber sitting in the centrifuge. This is the, again the centrifuge is going around like that. Red blood cells, layer of white cells, and then the plasma sitting on top of, of that. And then you just pull off. And then all of the contaminant or the contaminated uh, dirty plasma gets a, a collected in a removal bag, um, and then there's a bunch of other bags on the on the circuit here. The extracorporeal circuit is anticoagulated typically with citrate uh, to prevent clotting. So we have a citrate bag that delivers the citrate. We have saline that's just sitting there to prime the machine and to provide. Uh, volume if you need it. All the bad stuff goes into this bag and then we have a bunch of other bags that are usually the replacement solution. And that could be plasma, it could be colloid, or it could be albumin, or it could be crystalloid, depending on what you want to replace or the fluid that you remove. There's another way that you can do uh, a therapeutic plasma exchange that doesn't involve the centrifuge, and this is filtration uh, apheresis or plasmapheresis, and this is the, the type of therapy that is often provided on a, a dialysis kind of a platform like the Prismaflex uh, or even a, a machine like the Phoenix, uh, which is an IHD platform, could be modified to do this kind of therapy in which now the blood comes out of the patient and it's separated, or uh, at least the plasma is separated off the cellular components of the blood by a a plasma filter or a plasma separator. 
and this is just a fancy dialysis-like device, and, uh, that, except it's got great big holes in it. Uh, and it's got big enough holes that allow us not only the, the, the watery part of plasma, but also all the proteins in the plasma to be uh, siphoned off, and what it leaves behind is the, uh, is the cells. And then once the, the plasma is separated, it goes to the waste bag, and then the replacement solutions can be added back to the packed cells that, that remain, and that delivered back to the patient. So various ways in which this can be done, and there are other modifications that can be done to these, to these uh, uh, circuits so that if you needed to do other specific kinds of modifications uh, to the plasma, like running them through columns or other things like that, that, that could be accommodated. Now, what are the indications in human medicine for doing uh, a treatment like a therapeutic plasma exchange? And, and they're broken down to various categories, a whole variety of neuromuscular diseases, uh, a variety of hematologic diseases, some renal diseases, and other metabolic disorders um, that uh, human patients uh, are afflicted with. The, uh, the uh, Therapeutic Apheresis Society uh, now categorizes these diseases and they actually tell, uh, they, they assign a value to what is the role, or the, the, what is the, the role in which there's evidence that therapeutic plasma exchange is the best treatment or is a good treatment or maybe a good treatment or is probably not a good treatment for the management of that disease. And that's the, this uh, ASFA category. And if it's a category one disease, that means that therapeutic plasma exchange is the standard of care for the management of that disease. And then as the numbers get bigger, it either means that we don't know exactly, we don't have enough evidence to suggest that this is the best treatment. It's probably a good treatment. And then when you get out to category four, then it, it probably <coughs> is suggesting that this is probably not going to provide much uh, efficacy for the disease. Obviously, we don't have any of this kind of information yet because uh, you know, collectively across all of us, we've probably only done a few handfuls of these kinds of therapies. But this would provide us some guidance and some guidelines as to which diseases we might think we have corollaries in veterinary medicine and what's the likelihood based on the human information that this kind of therapy might be, might be useful. And if we look at those disease processes that we co commonly deal with in which there may be a potential benefit or a value of therapeutic plasma exchange, you can think about some of these. Uh, myasthenia gravis is the one we probably have the most experience with and it's one in which we actually see a lot of efficacy and a lot of good uh, response. Uh, we've also been looking at immune-mediated uh, hemolytic anemia. I'll show you some examples of these. This is a disease that now we have some pretty good evidence that this is a good treatment modality for those. But there are lots and lots of other diseases that we haven't examined yet that look like good targets or good candidates for the application of this disease where it might make a very significant therapeutic inroad where drug therapy, other kinds of medical therapies really have uh, not been effective or aren't effective for that patient. So let's just look at uh, a couple of these. So the first one that I want to sort of share with you is acquired myasthenia gravis. This is a neuromuscular disease that you're probably all familiar with. We presume that it's antibody mediated uh, due to an uh, antibodies that cause an activation of the neuromuscular in place so that there's not the appropriate or the normal transmission of signals across the neuromuscular implant that would then promote uh, muscular weakness and muscular uh, inabilities, resulting in clinical signs that are typically megasophagus and subsequent to this then aspiration pneumonia, exercise-induced weakness or collapse, and then many times these animals go into respiratory failure requiring mechanical ventilation. This is, uh, this is the first patient that we treated with, uh, with therapeutic apheresis. This um, is Marley, an eight-year-old uh, Veronese, uh, 30, 30, almost 38 kilos, with a very interesting history. 
Uh, June and July of the, of the year, he was noted to be gagging, had, and they actually identified that he had a, um, a mediastinal mass, so he probably had a thymoma, which is common uh, 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 predisposition for dogs with myasthenia. And that, and that was surgically removed. And then a month later, after the surgical removal, he still developed progressive weakness, collapse on walking, started to shake, inability to move his, uh, to move his head appropriately, and then developed an esophagus. Um, and, and then in September, he presented to our service for therapeutic plasma exchange because he was resistant to all the appropriate and even uh, very aggressive medical managements and still uh, had very little clinical relief. At presentation uh, in our hospital, he was recumbent, weak, almost non almost, well, he was non ambulatory, but almost couldn't stand and had really fairly profound muscular atrophy. We did three plasma exchanges, and the important information on this one, and what we typically exchange is about one plasma volume with each treatment. Uh, and the other important information on the two other pieces of important information on this slide, uh, the treatment strategy, because we didn't know what the heck we were doing when we started this, it, the dog came in on a Thursday, and, and so we thought, eh, you know, we're not really going to want to be here on the weekend, so maybe we'll do Thursday, Friday, Monday. How about that? <laughs> and uh, so that's the, stra that's the rationale for the strategy that we, we started with, but it's turned out to be, I think, a, a useful strategy, maybe not even the, the kind of strategy they have used in human patients, but I like this strategy where we do two days kind of simultaneously, and we've tried to kind of keep that as our protocol so that we don't have, you know, 15 treatments and each one has a different schedule and then you can't figure out what you were doing. So that's, a, and then the other thing that uh, I'll show you since it's on this slide is the, the antibody removal that we actually have. It's really nice, you can just, you know, at the end of the day, you know what the volume is in the bag, you stick a needle in the bag, you take an aliquot, you measure the antibody concentration, and you've got the entire antibody removal that, you, that occurred in that, in that day. And so we removed uh, almost, you know, three and a half nanomolars of antibody. How many have ever thought about how many nanomolars of antibody are running around in the patient? Um, uh, but the other, the other feature was that uh, this is the titer. So 0 0.6 above 0 0.6 is kind of considered diagnostic for myasthenia, and he had a very high titer. We removed this much antibody in terms of nanomoles. This was the titer on the second day, so really substantial reduction in titer, we removed some more antibody, uh, but by Monday, the titer's back up again to the diagnostic level, and I'll tell you that, that it's not too much longer and it's back up to there. Um, in fact, this shows that, so this is when he came in, and then progressively throughout the, the subsequent months, the antibody titer was right back where it was before, yet the animal was asymptomatic. And so we found this incredible disconnect between antibody titer and clinical response. And so something else is going on in these animals that's not entirely associated with their antibody levels. And that's another new observation. That's, that's an observation that's been known. And let me just show, this is Marley on day one. Um, and, and again, as typical of these dogs, I mean, they come in, they have no expression at all. This dog couldn't, <coughs> couldn't blink its eyes, it couldn't, and they just have this, as defined, this really tragic look to them, and they do. I mean, this dog just really looked tragic. Sitting here on the, on the table, couldn't move, couldn't blink, couldn't do anything, was minutes away from probably getting on a ventilator. Uh, and um, this is, this is the, the apparatus that we used to treat them with. On day two, he came into that, well, actually by the end of the treatment on the first day, I almost thought that I could see a little bit of glimmer in his eye, and I almost thought that he maybe had a little bit of movement in his eye, but that was probably me just being a little bit uh, hopeful. But by day two, on the second day when he came in, so this is only you know 24 hours later, the dog's brighter in attitude, more engaging in the, in the treatment room, was responsive to the owner visit, and actually at the end of the second treatment, 
I thought that he could actually stand uh, and support himself. The neurologist, eh, yeah, every once in a while he'll stand, so they burst that bubble too. But uh, <laughs> our thought was that, that he was really uh, probably a little bit stronger, even by the end of treatment on the next day. When we came in on Monday to treat him, the dog actually pulled us from the ward back to the, to the treatment room. Uh, and so on the third day, which the third treatment, which was day five, uh, he walked from the wards to the treatment room. He had sterile posture during the entire treatment, was clinically normal in strength and ambulation and me me uh, mentation at the end, and pulled us back to the ward at the end of the treatment. And so from day one to day five, Marley went from looking like this on day one to looking like this on day five. I mean, you really felt like you were touched by a creator and reached out and, and did something magical for that dog. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we didn't have x -ray, any x-rays on him until a month later, but by one month, uh, there was no uh, evidence that, uh, of any uh, magosophagus, and it looks like his magosophagus resolved within that period of time. And actually, the, and this is the second patient, and I'll just show day one, the animal sling supported, can't walk on day five, entirely ambulatory. Um, and so very, very dramatic effects. Let me pass over some of that other stuff in the day the next Yeah, they're all on all those drugs, and their and their treatment failures for all those drugs, but we still continue them on. The next, the next disease I want to talk to you real quickly about is immune-mediated hemolytic anemia. And this one actually excites me a little bit more than uh, than the uh, myasthenia, even though that's very dramatic. But that's for neurologists, you know, <laughs> and and we're the ones that are often treating these. And again, this is an antibody-mediated disease where you've got circulating antibodies that are reacting with receptors on the cell, the red cells, uh, to cause them to either be uh, removed uh, extravascularly or uh, to, to undergo intravascular uh, hemolysis. Again, these patients <coughs> uh, present with all the signs that you would expect from, from their anemia usually treated with immunosuppressive drugs and, and transfusions if you can get away with it, and often lots of immunosuppressive drugs. And in a, most of the cases, these drug, this drug strategy is probably effective, but we've all started to recognize, I think, that we have these animals that have, or we're starting to see more and more and more uh, drug-resistant kinds of patients, and patients that prevent with much more severe disease than we used to see several years ago. So here's, here's Heathrow, presented to the referring veterinarian in July, had a matter of 24. Uh, uh, it was recognized as of having uh, hemolytic anemia. Uh, the next day is a matter of it's down to 18. Uh, and, um, that, but he was still doing well and stable at about, you know, this, this hematocrit. He was treated with uh, dexamethasone, cyclosporin, prednisolone, leplinamide, uh, and all of these therapies, and uh, entirely unresponsive to all those, and his hematocrit's continuing to drop. So a presentation to us on day one is hematocrit's 12 and a half uh, on the first day. Uh, this number's a little bit confusing, you know, and there was a transfusion here, so, you know, he didn't get that dramatic a response during the during his treatment, and he got treated with the same protocol, day one, day two, and then this is uh, day uh, five, I think, uh, for the third treatment. This is what this slide agglutination test looked like pre-treatment on day one. Very, very severe agglutination. By the end of the treatment on day one, this is what the slide agglutination looked like. Come back on day two, pre pre treatment agglutination again. So even though we removed a lot of antibody, you get rebound of the antibody and redistribution of antibody out from the, the interstitial compartment. So still had a little bit of agglutination on day two, but less than before. And by the end of the treatment on day two, then there's no evidence of agglutination. And then on day on the third treatment, which was I guess in this case was day four. Uh, essentially no evidence of agglutination either before or after uh, the treatment. 
what's even more important, if we look uh, before treatment, this this dog now has got a hematocrit of 12, 12 and a half, been on all these drugs, none of the drug, drugs help. It's entirely incompatible to any of the bro blood products that we have in our hospital. And we have a very, very large volunteer uh, blood banking program. So we had lots of blood that we could have chosen from, and we couldn't find a donor that this dog would respond to. Within one and a half hours into the treatment, we repeated the cross-match, and now this animal's cross-match compatible with uh, all of these dogs. And we actually could transfuse this dog an hour into the treatment. Uh, and then progressively, and then, you know, it becomes incompatible again, but he didn't drop any, he held all those cells that we gave him, uh, and uh, progressively over the treatment, and then by the end of the third treatment, he's cross-match compatible with all these donors. And the dog goes from looking like that to looking like that. And like that. Uh, two more real quick ones that I'll show. We actually uh, did a horse uh, uh, last summer. This is a, a horse that presented with polyneuritis equi, which the, the equine neurologists, I guess, feel that they don't understand this disease very well. But they think that this is an equivalent disease to Guillain-Barre syndrome in human patients which is, uh, has uh, a category one indication for therapeutic, therapeutic plasma exchange in humans. And so even though this horse had a very chronic disease compared to the Guillain-Barre that normally presents in humans, uh, everybody was up to trying it. And, and, uh, and so I show a couple things. One, here's the chamber, and the, and the equine blood uh, plasma is so yellow, you know, that you can, you can really see nicely in this case, the, the blood the blood layer here. This is a this is the white cell layer here, and then all the plasma on top. The point that I really wanted to, to illustrate here is we processed 55 liters of blood from this from this horse and exchanged 27 liters of plasma. You know, that, that was just, this is a G whiz thing. So you all go ooh. Oh, my <laughs> And it took about eight hours to do it because the machine runs very slowly. Um, then the last thing I will show you, just a couple of slides with, uh, with another disease that we're very excited to treat. We've been looking and wanting to treat uh, some other diseases. And the one that we've uh, really been kind of uh, uh, concerned about is Lyme-associated nephritis. And uh, we've done two patients now. And, and again, I think that the benefits are, are a little bit equivocal at this point, but uh, I think we're getting some insights to suggest that they might, uh, that, that might this might be an, an important and an appropriate therapy approach. What I think as Dr. Uh, Bant mentioned the other day, or somebody mentioned, maybe it's Dr. Francais, one of the problems that we have with these kinds of therapies is we don't have a lot of markers to suggest when we've done good and when we haven't done good. I mean, fortunately, with the IMHA, the only marker, we have some things that we're looking at now, but there aren't any markers except the only thing we could find is slight agglutination, you know, or you maybe you could look at uh, indirect Coombs test or something like that that might be. For myasthenia, we had the antibody titers, but the antibody titers may not have correlate with the disease. And clearly with this slime associated with arthritis, we don't have a lot of markers to suggest what we've done and what we've done that. But this was a dog that presented looked very typical of Lyme nephritis. He was Lyme positive. Uh, and and he had and uh, he had progressive uh, azotemia here. And he actually this dog actually had to get a dialysis session. Uh, and that's what's kind of grayed out here. And I wanted to sort of uh, not bias your interpretation because this big drop in 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 uh, at BUN here is because of dialysis, not because of the apheresis treatment that we provided that was arrow. Uh, wouldn't that be nice, though? But the other, and then then we uh, resumed. He got treated with Michael Scott. Started treated on Michael Phenolate right after that. And then, and because uh, this dog developed uh, uh, some embolic disease, it, it prevented us from doing the other treatments at the normal schedule. And so we didn't get another treatment until about here. But even though there looks like a dramatic change in the azotemia here. All of the effects of this singular dialysis treatment would have been over at about this point in time. And, and, uh, and if the dog's renal function were really at this level, and we did a dialysis, by three or four days after the, the treatment, the dog should be when should be re-equilibrated back to wherever its real function is. 
and uh, either in combination with the mycophenolate, uh, w which is likely, there seems to be some dramatic improvement in this dog's renal function as a result of maybe that combination of therapy. We see that also with the creatinine, and I've also grayed this area out again because uh, uh, from here to here, obviously the dialysis treatment is influencing the, the numbers, but beyond that point, then the, uh, the dialysis treatment can't be, uh, can't be blamed on any or, uh, or even ascribed to any of the benefit. So we see after this apheresis treatment, there's, there's an improvement in renal function. Creatinine seems to go up again, but then when he gets another treatment here, then we also have some additional improvement in the function. So in this patient anyway, that's, it appears that there might be some benefit to the apheresis maybe removing cytokines, maybe removing a uh, complement or something in these patients, probably not antibody per se that's causing this, but uh, something that's associated with the, with the plasma exchange that's causing benefit in kidney function. If we look at the proteinuria uh, with urine protein creatinine ratio, we actually see a very profound dramatic in, uh, decrease in the proteinuria even before we started the mycophenolate therapy. Uh, that's associated with the with the plasma exchange at this point here. And when the dog got the second plasma exchange, it looks like there might be another associated benefit. And then the combination of the of the, the two therapies probably then have resulted in this improvement that, that has occurred. And if we look, uh, this is the second dog uh, with Lyme associated nephritis. Actually got treated with mycophenolate before the apheresis treatments got started. Uh, had three treatments here, and even though there was a progressive in, uh, increase in the azotemia, it looks like the combination of these therapies uh, have resulted in dramatic improvement in the, in the function there. Dramatic improvement in the proteinuria uh, uh, that we probably wouldn't expect to see in this time frame with that disease process, even though we see a milder form of this in California. And so in conclusions, I'd say even though therapeutic plasma exchange has probably very narrowly targeted veterinary indications, I think it's a very important new therapeutic approach or modality for a variety of really problematic diseases that we see. I think that it's one of its major, we haven't treated patients, you know, progressively like you might with dialysis or they might in some human patients. But what I think it really does is permits very effective and kind of instantaneous control of disease while you're waiting for your other therapies to come in and take hold. And for, for many patients then, it, it might be the only therapeutic option which will allow control of disease uh, that, would otherwise, that would otherwise kill them. So sort of an introduction to TPE. I know there are others in the room that are starting to dabble with this, and so uh, I think uh, you know this is something that uh, we hope will be an important new adjunct for extracorporeal therapy programs. So try to put this in your program, and uh, and hopefully a new modality of treatment for some problematic diseases.